So for the seven years that I've had this channel, I've primarily discussed zombies, apocalypses, and dangerous scenarios, but never really brought up the actual people that faced off against the undead or infected in any definitive detail outside of Left 4 Dead. So I figured why not bring them into the light and have a discussion on just how good they are as survivors and decide who deserves the title of the best zombie survivor, or at least rank them just so. So today I'll be putting together the zombie survivor tier list. Before we get started, if there's one thing we need in day-to-day -day survival, zombies or not, it's a decent way of food preparation. And with today's sponsor, Factor, meeting your nutritional goals is easier than ever by delivering fresh, never-frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Why do takeout when you can take in the good food? Cut back on takeout in general for a friendlier budget and get Factor instead. Not only is Factor cheaper than average takeout, but meals are ready faster than restaurant delivery in just two minutes. I've been trying to keep my protein intake up while I'm working out trying to get ready for the zombie apocalypse, so I've elevated that consumption at home with some of their delectable meals, like the herb crusted chicken or the black pepper and sage pork chop meal. I personally go ham on that black pepper and sage pork chop, and again was blown away about how quick and easy and delicious it is, especially since I spend most of my time editing, so having something quick and good to prepare saves me time and money. And keep my gains up with a good old-fashioned pork chop that even Coach would love. That is some five-star gourmet shit! Get on the delicious delicacy revolution sent to your home instead of fighting the zombies to get your food and head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code WSG50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. It's on screen and in the description. So just do it! and get them good eats with Factor. They rule. Speaking of that, let's see some of the rules. As to not bog this down with a long intro, let's quickly go over who we are bringing into the apocalyptic fray. We will only be covering individuals that come from universes that experienced mostly traditional zombie or zombie-like outbreaks. So no Isaac Clarke, Doomslayer, or Master Chief, because those three would just be beyond Z-tier instantly. There are plenty characters out there that have fought, survived, and died, but if we tried rating every single survivor out there, this video would be obnoxiously long and I've got other stuff to do. So today, we are just going over the overall best zombie survivor from each well-known zombie franchise and ranking them based on different categories ranging from their prior history, resourcefulness, combat skill and durability, mentality, and plot armor. But with all of these laid out, we can start off this fantastic tier list here. Link in the description if you'd like to do this for yourself. And I think a good jumping off point would be the pinnacle survivor of the Walking Dead comic and TV series himself, Rick Grimes. What? Why'd you bring us here? Now, Rick Grimes is definitely a face that any zombie lover would think of when it comes to a survivor. Since his awakening in the Georgian hospital, Rick has fought his way to finding his family, clashing with his former best friend, and proven time and time again he has the tenacity, willpower, and survivability to prove himself as the de facto leader of his group and eventually whole societies. Killing hundreds of walkers in his time and warring against opposing living factions, Rick has transformed hellaciously to meet the critical demands of conflict each foe has presented him. His prior history as a sheriff's deputy already had him dealing with the belligerent and dangerous, and even had him in the line of fire numerous times, lending to his cool-headedness for intense situations and having the brawn, combat skill, and weapon proficiency to back it all up. He is resourceful in nature that he can take down foes with anything nearby and even can resort to using his bare teeth to kill an opponent. He has been shown to take ludicrous amounts of damage and still be able to fight back and carry on for miles even. While the wildfire virus outbreak has tested his mentality to the point of break numerous times with the death of his loved ones, he has carried on each and every time becoming stronger from each instance, vowing to protect those that still live even more fervently than before. While plot armor is something most of the Walking Dead cast gets away with when either in the grasp of a walker or in the middle of a full-on shootout, Rick's time before and after the apocalypse can be more than a 
enough to give good reason to this plot armor that he seems to wield. Rick's sheer tenacity, way that he evolves from every skirmish that he encounters, going from this just normal man to a ravenous person to a de facto leader, his will as a leader to guide his flock and to always win over foe, living or dead, definitely puts the grimy boy at the Z tier of our zombie survivors. If you already saw my video that was given a false copyright strike titled Which Group of Survivors is Better, Left 4 Dead 1 or 2, you probably know already I hold Bill to a high degree in terms of being a survivor for a zombie apocalypse. A badass Vietnam veteran who takes no ship from no one that can fight a hospital of infected nearly comatose, armed in only a hospital gown, bone saw, and knife. Showing how much he can kick some zombie ass with little resources. Like Rick, he serves as the de facto leader of his ragged tag bunch, gearing them in directions that lead them to safety or rescue. His skills in hand-to-hand -hand and firearm combat are quite high thanks to his years in the service. His mentality to do what is necessary in any given situation to ensure his and his group's survival are admirable, but can also make greater enemies. Traveling across large distances of the American Northeast with his group, their immunity and sheer pain tolerance against mutated infected has given them a bit of video game plot armor, but even in the comics can Bill brush off damage that would incapacitate other healthy, able-bodied people. Dude even took on three tanks and took every one of them down down in his own sacrificial attack. However, the ravages of time and prior wartime injuries have slowed him down a little bit, and it's hard to tell if his advanced years would have caught up with him if, if he had not died prematurely with his group. Bill was lucky enough to be immune to the green flu virus, so opposing factions of people weren't really a consistent threat, and the options for survivors for him to team up with were slim pickings as well. While Bill is the giga chat survivor of the Left 4 Dead series, I'm gonna have to put him in the A tier. freelance photographer that has covered wars, you know. He has risen to fame with his deep scoops on the Willamette outbreak trying to expose the U.S. government. While his expose never was fully admitted, his times of both killing and taking pictures of the dead has given him ample opportunity to figure out his ways of own survival, and along the way, he has also reluctantly teamed up with the most unlikeliest of allies. Frank West, despite having spent time in wars, was described by Dead Rising designer Kaiji Inafune as just a regular American average. Joe, and despite some of his rather insane feats, most of his characteristics and survivability would have to be attributed to gameplay fairness and sheer lunacy. Taking pictures at war could in some way have at least made him somewhat combat ready, and his willingness to get the best shots and story possible in these kinds of scenarios have put him in deep trouble but have given him a level head. However, I don't think he would be legitimately able to survive the Willamette Mall for three days against thousands of zombies and tons of psychopaths, using only what's around to fend them all off. Don't get me wrong, the dude is extremely resourceful, enough to basically use any nearby object as a weapon to fend off the undead. But then again, wouldn't most people do the exact same thing in a fight or flight response? Also, downing tons of food and orange juice wouldn't be the best for healing up an infected bite wound or fresh bullet hole from an escaped convict. Frank West is probably one of the most plot-armored individuals in video game zombie history, offering much of his fate up to, well, it's a video game. Being bitten constantly and not actually being immune? I don't know, have some OJ. His mentality is a bit all over the place when it comes to the franchise as a whole. While he is headstrong and very goal-oriented, he did try and help others with a bit of charisma and skepticism entwined. Dead Rising 2 off the record and Dead Rising 4 both portray him in a very different light, making him a cynical asshole putting his focus on the story and the money behind it above all else. But nonetheless, it's his drive to become famous with his writing and photography that keeps him going. But how good is a story if you are dead or your camera's broken? But he is also shown to be proficient in wrestling and is pretty damn strong in most cases, and over time can learn to demolish infected easily just by killing them more and more. But again, a lot of this likens him to being an average Joe that just beefs up abnormally thanks to video game logic. In terms of his survivor rating though, with everything he's 
gone through at least, I'd put him on the high end of the B tier. Going from pinnacle survivors, we have probably the pinnacle of an ordinary human male. Sean Riley isn't exactly who you would want to either be partnered up with or be when the zombies come knocking. Although, having a nice cold pint with him would probably be a yeah, boy. moment. Sean is the embodiment of the average Joe that Frank West was supposed to embody. Living a paycheck-to-paycheck -paycheck life, in a dead-end job with a best friend with no goals or ambition, and literally living every day as if he were a zombie, nothing about Sean in his pre-outbreak life screams survivor in any way, shape, or form. He kind of stumbled his way into a leadership position while somehow surviving London's outbreak. Like Frank West, he will use anything, and I mean anything, to try and take out a Zed. However, using vinyls, pull cues, and more to no effect means that resourcefulness is less than wanted. Everyone follows him because there's really no other option as the other two men are either too scared or too stupid to lead. Did it run? I didn't want to crop your style. He can take decent damage and will do what's necessary for his group, but going to a bar out of all places during a zombie outbreak? Really? And the fact that Sean is the only dude to survive is really impressive plot armor-wise, considering he went straight into a zombie horde. Although, if Diane can do it with her dead boyfriend's severed arm, then why not him? Regardless, Sean's quick thinking of using music discs, going to bars, and not barricading all entry points at first would literally have him dead if it weren't for the best comedic setting of all time requiring him to be alive. Sean is sadly gonna go in the F tier. The definition of a grizzled old man hardened by the harsh realities of a post-apocalyptic life, Joel Miller lost everything leading up to the dawn of the Cordyceps outbreak. He survived for over two decades in this world, living as a smuggler and still going strong despite becoming numb and callous to everything the bleak landscape and its inhabitants had to offer. Joel's time before Ellie, with his brother Tommy, was one of a dark and perceptually evil way of survival. Methods that some would deem reprehensible to some, but necessary to others to weather a land of no laws. Over 20 years, Joel and Tommy would trick, torture, and murder countless innocent people to acquire their supplies, even resorting to faking being injured to lure in people to ambush them. Joel would eventually be ditched by Tommy, leaving him to fend for his own for a time until meeting up with Tess, where he would use his expertise in strong arming and murder in the smuggling business to get supplies in and out of quarantine zones. In that entire stretch of time, he did not suffer too many life threatening injuries nor did he get bitten, nor did he lose anything or anyone valuable to him. It was not until he was tasked with smuggling Ellie to a Firefly base that his perspective changed and his paternal instincts slowly started to reanimate. Although losing Tess, Ellie helped Joel find his humanity again, and together they would travel from Boston to Salt Lake City, defeating many infected and crazed human enemies alike. Joel even single-handedly wiped out an entire Firefly armed base by himself to save Ellie and eventually only dying after years of being separated from Ellie and slipping up for the first time and not being insecure, securing his death at the hands of Abby and her group. Joel is a pinnacle survivor in the fact that he learned what had to be done to survive and quick. While nothing of honor was gained from his actions, spending two decades out in the outbreak with a group smaller than Hansen means a whole hell of a lot in his survivor tier list placement. This isn't a test of morality. That's never what is going on in a zombie apocalypse. He got the job done when it came to getting food, water, medicine, and more for him and his brother and eventually girlfriend. His ruthlessness only aided in fighting off opposing forces and keeping himself to such low numbers meant less resources to spread out, although the anxiety of solitude day to day would eat away just about everyone. Even when his time as a violent hunter came to an end with Tess and becoming a smuggler, Joel easily could acclimate to quarantine life and do a job when needed with no issue. Even with a less than experienced teenager at his side did he adapt to teach her how to survive and impress on her the important aspects aspects of who to trust and how to fight. Masking up when entering infested areas, knowing how to execute clickers with ease, and knowing when to avoid conflicts with the infected and the living. Joel 
by himself or with others he can trust, evolves to suit the need of survival for that given situation going forward. And the fact that he only perished years after his surrogate daughter grew distant with him, leading to him giving out his name to those seeking revenge, just means he is only human after all, and every person eventually fucks up. It only took him like 23 years to die. So, Joel goes in the Z tier. You and me. It's just you and me. The survivor with a rarely seen face, Kyle Crane's previous life is shrouded in mystery outside of details including being raised in Chicago where he was a track star athlete in high school. Spending some time in the United States Armed Forces, he would be discharged for unknown reasons where he would find work as a mercenary for hire that was eventually picked up by the GRE. Eventually, his missions would lead him to Haran to hunt down Suleiman to stop the outbreak of the Haran virus and procure a cure in the quarantine city. Crane's time in track proved to be extremely extremely beneficial against the fast-moving infected and volatiles of the Huron virus as he maneuvered his way across the city, solving mysteries, helping survivors, and maintaining his own health with Antizen after being bitten early on. He is quick to aid anyone in need and acts as a diplomat trying to connect groups and people without violence, although most often leading to violent situations he perseveres from anyways. All other survivors in the tower regard him as the best at being a runner for supplies and and maintaining the tower's security and supplies, despite learning the ins and outs of basic parkour and the means of the job in less than a day, meaning he is quick to acclimating to difficult jobs and affairs. He is durable and can withstand heavy damage from many mutated abominations and heavily armed individuals. He is good-hearted in nature to a fall, even willing to work with war criminals to meet his people's needs, and often believes what the GRE tell him to an extent. Gullible to work for others and putting himself in harm's way for sometimes no good reason, even retrieving tapes for a mentally deficient man, he does what he can to establish some normalcy in this apocalyptic affair, although his efforts would eventually lead him to either nuking himself or becoming the world's strongest volatile. But with his expertise in gullibility, his strength and speed, and way of maneuvering, I would put Crane at the A tier. I debated on if Lee Everett should be the one here, but Clementine, well, survived for more than one game. Starting off her adolescence in the midst of a zombie apocalypse, she was mostly coddled under the care of Lee Everett, leaving much of the hardships, fighting, and survivalhood to the adults around her. It wasn't until one train ride that a guy told Lee that he needs to teach her how to survive, so Lee taught her how to shoot a gun and keep her hair short to avoid being grabbed easily. She was taught by Lee how to not be a kid, because being a kid in a zombie apocalypse would get her killed. That's what happened to Duck. She would learn to fight on her own slowly until the untimely demise of her father figure, and after being separated from Omid and Krista, Clementine learned to do everything for herself. Being mauled by a stray dog and suturing her own wounds, killing many a walker and person alike, negotiating terms with others, surviving being shot in the middle of nowhere, knowing how to kill or maneuver through hordes of walkers without letting emotions get awry, and becoming more of a hardened person than many adults she encounters. Clementine, much like her mentor, only really dying to try and protect their surrogate child and allowing them to learn the darkness of the world by having to shoot them or leave them to die. She, however, is limited to how much she can do as a teenage girl, and in many cases her stature and not-so-impressive strength can lead her to unsavory situations against fully grown adults. But also, her visage as a young woman leaves her to be an unexpected threat to many that would underestimate this small girl. Clementine might have started off as a little girl, but by the end was a spitting image of Lee, a tough bitch ready to tackle anything and anyone just to survive and to see her loved ones prosper. Clementine gets a spot in the A tier. 
The cool as hell dude with a cooler stash, Kenneth Hall hails as a police officer from Everett, Wisconsin. Forced to run for his life when the entire police precinct was overrun by the undead, Officer Hall fled to Milwaukee trying to find safety wherever he can along his journey to Fort Pasture, where he says his brother is there waiting for him. Meeting with a group of survivors, he makes his way to Crossroads Mall, being the de facto leader of his group through his sheer intimidating appearance, uniform, and stoic demeanor. Plus, the shotgun helped. Clearing out the mall and only suffering a scrape, another group of survivors arrives via box truck, and he is informed that they had just escaped Fort Pastor, as the compound was completely overrun. Foolishly doubting his brother's demise, he almost abandons his new group entirely, only to be slowed down and be told his talents and specialties were gravely needed by his new band of people. Seeing Andy across the street holding signs, he befriends the long-haired, scrawny gun store owner and decides to stick with his group. Whenever any armed ventures are made, Kenneth is usually at the front line or even in calm situations is usually the only one brandishing a firearm at his side. He is always prepared. Being a brick house of an officer of the law, it's easy to see his prior history easily coming into effect when it comes to conflict and de-escalation, much like Rick Grimes. Kenneth, however, is a bit more hot-headed and quick to making decisions to go to places that make little to no sense to go to. While the mall is heavily fortified and the group is mostly living it out in style, after a few deaths as a result of a zombified pregnant mom and her driven insane husband, Kenneth leads the idea in leaving the fucking mall. Because now I realize that there are some things worse than death, and one of them is sitting here waiting to die. I don't want to die here. Hop in my boat and take it for a pleasure cruise, you jackasses. That's a good idea. There's islands out in those lakes. There's not a lot of people on them. Yeah, it's a good idea. Are you crazy? I'm just plain stupid. Spurring others to say, you know what? I don't want to die here. I want to go live on an island somewhere far away. First, he wanted to go to a fort that people told him was clearly marked as overrun. You should not go here. The very thing he ran away from in the first place because his police sector was taken over. And then he says, I don't want to die in a mall. And is okay with abandoning this stronghold he has set up and has tons of supplies in to go somewhere tropical when there's no guarantee safety is insured. Kenneth might be a badass with a shotgun and can lead somewhat. But his actions are outweighed in stupid recklessness and if the ending to the series leads to anything it's that he got him and his crew killed with that said Kenneth is going in the bottom of C tier a Chinese woman with incredible conviction, Zan Mei, is the sharp weapons expert of a group of survivors stranded on Benoit and beyond. Born and raised in China, her father was the chief inspector of the Hong Kong Police Department before he was murdered by a triad enforcer when she was only 10. Vowing to uphold his honor, she continued the martial arts training he had put her under and studied and eventually graduated at the top of her class to join the Hong Kong Police Force. She was given the honor of being a part of the department's first all-female squadron, However, this was an honor superficial in nature as the department created the group only for show, never training the women for any purpose. Protesting this injustice, Jean Mei was sent to the island of Benoit to spy on Westerners, seeing how rich Americans are spending their time in luxurious resorts. She took on the job of hotel staff to spy for some reason, and that's when the HK virus outbreak was let loose. Jean Mei's expertise in bladed weaponry comes from years of training and being yet another police officer on the survivor tier list, she could be diplomatic with other survivors and equally as deadly. Being proficient with bladed weapons can make her a force to be reckoned with against hordes of undead, but if her perks in game lead to anything, it's her lack of firearms knowledge. She knows how to use a bladed weapon, but sucks with a gun. She is the most passionate of her group and does what is needed to be done for other people. She has found herself to be a part of many outbreaks in the Dead Island franchise and has survived each and every experience. She is a key component of her group, but seems to be the most prevalent amongst them, with the football player and Perna both fading into obscurity after Riptide, but at the same time, isn't efficient at survival without being part of a group, it seems. Jean May's expertise at least gears her up to an A tier, but without a bladed weapon in hand, it's hard to see her being anywhere else but B tier.
time to nut up or shut up with everyone's favorite twinkie loving Elvis praising redneck Tallahassee. An engineer before the outbreak, Tallahassee witnessed his son Buck being eaten alive by the zombie horde. This traumatizing event caused him to become cynical, hardened, and overall pissed off at the world, and more specifically, the zombies that now rule it. Using his engineering skills, he whips together weapons in any shape or form to slaughter the undead, and is quite proficient in doing so. His main goal in life for a time being just to kill as many zombies as possible before running into his group and becoming a surrogate father to Little Rock and a jolly old uncle type to Columbus and Wichita. He lets his obsessions take the better of his judgment though. If he believes Twinkies are nearby or within reach, he will go out of his way, even if it's not safe in any degree, to procure a chance at the little sweet treats. His love for celebrities like Bill Murray and Elvis Presley can also put him or others in danger, namely Bill Murray. Helping Mr. Murray dress up as a zombie to scare Columbus only for Columbus to blast the Ghostbuster in the chest full of buckshot. Something any sensible person would have known that a person in the zombie apocalypse wouldn't risk getting bit and instantly go for the kill. Especially since, you know, Tallahassee's whole character arc is hating zombies more than anyone else, so I don't get why he did this in the first place, but I digress. Tallahassee also going out of his way to try and reach Graceland in the midst of drama in his group. His fascination is not always being his downfall as he is a force of nature when properly armed. He can coordinate ways to get rid of tons of zombies, like single-handedly being able to wipe out nearly an entire amusement park's worth of zombies with only a Kimbo pistols in a small locked-off booth. Although, can you say it's that badass when it's pretty much just a shooting gallery where the zombies can never get to him? He was also able to coordinate tricking hundreds of zombies to fall off a tower by dangling off a hook. That is true badassness. Now, while he may be a badass, his sensibilities could be lukewarm and easily swayed with the smallest of trees. Trinkets. I would put him in the B tier of zombie survivors. Oh, you better be laying away. Groovy. Now let's get this straight from the get-go. Evil Dead is not a zombie outbreak, as Deadites are a wholly different and powerful entity than that of a typical zombie. Much like Halo's Flood or Dead Space's Necromorphs, if left out of hand, and can be an unstoppable force. However, unlike Master Chief and Isaac Clark, Ashley J. Williams is a way more average person. A supermarket clerk that, after a night in a possessed cabin, would change his life forever. Having all of his loved ones be turned by the Kandarian demon into Deadites, he would subsequently have to decapitate, slaughter, and maim all before him. Being completely tossed around by this supernatural evil, and even possessed by it, Ash persevered numerous times. Everyone around him eventually becoming victims and eventually soldiers of the Deadites, armed with nothing but his chainsaw and boomstick, Ashley J. Williams has warded off threats of Deadites in all shapes and sizes, enduring the worst forms of psychological torment through all ages of time, and even finding an evil zombie like leader version of himself known as Evil Ash back in the 1300s. Ash's heroic exploits would go completely unnoticed by the wider public when he returned to his time where he was labeled a psycho killer. After 30 years of obscurity, Ash would accidentally call upon the evil dead of the Necronomicon once again one night while stoned, and began his fight against them all over again that would eventually envelop most of the world. But in that time, would he easily hack and slashy his way through hordes of deadites and even bring back his friends from the Kandarian demon's blackened mental grip. All throughout this time, Ash, despite being full of himself for his insane exploits, would always try and help others if he could. Ash's bravado often gets the best of him, though, with his ego and playboy-esque life often being his largest downfall. I mean, he summoned the deadites again, and eventually in the TV series, all the world got taken over because of him getting stuck. Owned, overconfidence being key to many of his problems worsening in the first place. Despite that, he has learned a thing or two, being incredibly durable to all forms of hellacious damage from the super-powered Deadites, being able to outrun the Kandarian spirit which has been shown to travel as fast as a car, being able to recognize an evil threat just from a first glance, have skills into making engineering feats quickly in order to fortify safe havens or kill an optimal amount of Deadites, his proficiency with all types of firearms being 
being nearly maxed out. His strong will to survive is what keeps him ahead of most, being able to mutilate himself to prevent full infection, riding out psychological torment, and his tenacity at always finding ways to kill the undead with his patented weapons is nothing short of a pinnacle survivor. Dude has been infected and possessed numerous times, but always finds a way to snap back to reality, although most of the time through sheer dumb luck or coincidence. That being said, can a lot of what he has done be attributed to him being bestowed plot armor as the chosen one, prophesied by the Necronomicon itself? So, Ash is a comically overpowered but plot armored individual and is largely to blame for much of what happens with the Deadeye outbreaks. Against regular zombies and not being a chosen one, he would still be a damn fine survivor. So, he is going in the A tier for Mr. Ashy Slash. Oh boy, generic action movie main character, huzzah! Jerry Lane worked as a skilled investigator for the United Nations before settling down with his generic slice of Americana family in Philadelphia. When the zombie outbreak occurs, he is able to perfectly guide his family, get medication, sit still in the midst of a horde to witness a turn time, barricade his family in a building, and escape by a helicopter just in time before anyone of importance, aka his family and some random kid, is bitten cliche. He he is able to slingshot between Camp Humphreys in South Korea, Jerusalem, and survive a plane crash at the WHO lab in Wales. Each experience basically just being him arriving at a place, finding a breadcrumb of information, and running from the infected. Ultimately, Jerry doesn't do much in terms of being a survivor. He is literally just a plot device with advanced plot armor that can witness what he needs to experience to understand that this virus avoids the terminally ill. His closest encounters with actual zombies in survival are pretty scarce despite being in the middle of thousands of them. There's really no interaction between him and zombies, just him sitting there going, oh, death and love zombies. But by the end, when he actually does interact with zombies, they are just avoiding him so he can enjoy a nice can of Pepsi. Jerry is boring and offers nothing in terms of being a survivor. He is just a total badass where nothing can go wrong for him or his family. Fuck this empty shell of a character. You might say I'm biased, but fuck character writing like this. If it wasn't for his plot armor, this dude would have been jumped when trying to listen to a doll do a countdown in the middle of the Philadelphia riots. F tier for Jerry Lane. So, here we go, to go from a hollow character to this daddy of a chad of an Adonis is quite the shift. Sang Hua is a stubborn, lovable oaf who is ready to combat anything that puts his loved ones at risk. His prior life before the Train to Busan isn't known, but it's safe to say he worked in some sort of hard labor considering he has a physique like that. When shit hit the fan, Sang Hua was quick to defend his pregnant wife and get her and others to safety. Even when others would have betrayed him, like Sok Wu at the beginning of the train out break, did he go out of his way to save him, ultimately working in his and his wife's favor, even saving Suwon in the middle of a zombie outbreak when they get to a station. Out in the open, he was quick to find whatever he could to defend and arm himself to survive. He even banded together the men of the group and led them through a horde of zombies in a train car, fighting them off one by one. Dude even suplexed a zombie into the roof by himself and was able to survive with just duct tape and his sheer manly raw, throbbing strength. He was able to convince weak-willed men to be stronger and be better fathers and boyfriends through the notion of sacrifice and being better as people. The only reason for his demise was holding back a horde of infected via a glass door while the weaker of his group could try and get to the next car only to be held back by the greed and fear of the rest of the train residents for him to be bitten. But even then, De sang in his final conscious moments as the disease is riddling through his body, was able to hold off an entire horde by himself, keeping them all back before fully turning. His final actions, emboldening Sakwu to protect his wife and Suwon even more. Even in death did this Chad get others to be better versions of themselves and be better <clears throat> survivors. If he had been allowed to live on longer, Sang Hwa would have been the most unstoppable survivor in the quarantine of South Korea, and maybe Peninsula would have been a better movie. 
Sanghua's dominance, fighting skills, and resourcefulness put him in the A tier. I would have put Z tier, but he did sadly die early on for a zombie outbreak. Ahead of time, we'll be discussing Ultimus Tank, depicted from World at War to Black Ops 1. An American war hero with medals of honor throughout World War II, Corporal Tank Depsy was sent on a search and rescue mission to a German insane asylum to save an undercover agent within Group 935, a neutral science faction made up of the best minds in the world. During this rescue mission to the Verrucht facility, Tank was captured and his men killed. Group 935's doctor, Edward Richthofen, concocted experiments experiments on the corporal using element 115, causing him to be completely mind-controlled. Together with the doctor, the Soviet Nikolai Belinsky and Japanese soldier Takio Masaki, they journeyed around the world and even to the moon to complete Richthofen's evil scheme to destroy the Earth via the MPD, a black pyramid-like device which had been found by Richthofen years prior. In the device was Samantha Maxis, blah blah blah. Basically, Richthofen took over the world and took over all the zombies. But back to Mr. Tank Depsy, while his actions as a former mind slave to the Mad Doctor eventually led to one timeline of Earth being completely destroyed, Dempsey himself is quite the survivor. It's clear that he is extremely battle-hardened, being a decorated veteran with a resume in fighting hordes across space and time. He is quick to pick up on what weapons work best for exterminating the undead, no matter the time period and how complex the sci-fi behind these weapons might be. You can easily make the case that he isn't that durable due to all the Call of Duty Zombies characters going down in two hits, which is a reason I don't like Call of Duty Zombies unless you drink a nog, but I mean, look at the dude. Outside of gameplay purposes, you know this jacked Adonis could take some hits. Richtofen says he chose Tank purely for his brawn and strong will, because his intellect was extremely lacking. While he may be dumb as a brick, he can provide muscle to others, and the advent of a zombie apocalypse seems to be enjoyable to him even from the get-go, and even when he doesn't remember anything else. He is a definition meathead, with a knack for wartime killing, but can be easily manipulated to do stuff that isn't really in his best interests. So, he can be a total badass just mixed with a total dumbass in some regards. So we're gonna slap him in the B tier. Going in solo to a bloody and rage-filled world, Jim was a bicycle courier that was forced into a wreck by a reckless driver, causing him to be comatose while the rage virus ravaged London. Waking up in a hospital bed derived of nutrition for who knows how long, Jim walked the streets of London until arriving at a church to be chased down by the infected, a threat he knew absolutely nothing about. Survivors Mark and Selena save him as the reality of the world is told to him. Over time, he attempts to go home and is subsequently attacked by his former neighbor, where Mark is killed in front of him by Selena, showing a bite or drop of blood means immediate infection. Jim and Selena meet up with Frank and Hannah to survive at their high-rise apartment for a while before roaming the English countryside to scavenge for supplies and get to a safe haven in Manchester. Along the way, Jim would have to kill an infected child and replace a car tire while a horde fastly approached down a dark tunnel way. While he is tormented by constant nightmares of his loved ones and of being abandoned, he is dead set on on being there for the ones he found himself with. Jim's feats as a survivor didn't come into full fruition until the soldiers of the Worsley House revealed their intentions of putting both Hannah and Selena into sexual slavery with the faux promise of repopulating Britain after the infected have all but starved off. Jim's protest leading to his imprisonment led him to going full Rambo, taking out many armed soldiers armed with just a crowbar and his wit and ingenuity, releasing Captain infected like Mailer, he was able to cause enough chaos to basically wipe out the fully armed squadron of fully armed people nearly single-handedly, even gouging out the eyes of a soldier as if he were an infected himself. While Jim's fate is wildly different depending on which ending you prefer, there's like four different endings, he was noble and badass enough to always wipe out the military compound and get the two girls to safety. His survivorhood is more accustomed to fighting back against 
against healthy and living survivors, and it wasn't too often for him to directly face the infected himself, having only ever really confronted and in killing the infected child. While not being skilled in infected disposal, avoiding killing them frequently is actually not the worst thing since even one drop of blood can mean infection, so avoiding fighting them is probably for the best. Still, at some point you are going to have to fight them eventually because, I mean, they're fast moving and ravenous. And one zombie kid is not enough experience to have under your belt. And since most zombie media describes the living or uninfected as the true monsters, being able to take on a battalion with your only experience in life being a delivery boy is nothing to scoff at. Although it's hard to say if he would have done the same feats if he wasn't helped out so early on after waking up, let's just say this Philip J. Fry that woke up in a new world emerges with at least a tear of bees. A franchise with no lack in badasses, it was hard determining who to pick, but Leon Scott Kennedy was who came out on top. A federal agent for the DSO, a counterterrorism agency under direct presidential command, promoted to the position after being a police officer that survived the events of the 1998 Raccoon City destruction incident. Despite being warned by his superiors to stay away, he runs into Claire Redfield there to fight and discover what was going on in this veritable city of the dead. Getting split up, Leon must adapt quickly to his current situation after all they don't train you to deal with the undead in the academy going through the museum turned police station leon must search for supplies solve ridiculous puzzles and get out alive against abominations created by the g-virus and the onslaught of mr x in terms of combat skills leon during the events of re2 has a very basic gun and hand-to-hand -hand ability however by the events of re4 leon becomes a beefcake being able to kick the heads off infected villagers he's a pretty tough guy as well as being able to take a beating from the zombie undertaker Mr. X. In terms of a survivor, I'd say he has a decent mentality. However, he tends to jump headfirst into danger, not really thinking too much about the risks. He is very good at finding items for survival and gun attachments to help him survive longer. His plot armor is pretty thick as well, with him being in multiple games and spin-off animated shows. He is among Resident Evil's most prominent survivors and Resident Evil's undead are pretty fucking diverse, durable, and overall just hard to survive against in the first place. The fact that this guy has survived multiple large-scale encounters is nothing to scoff at. Honestly, with everything he has weathered, I'd put Mr. Kennedy in the Z tier. A game that's never getting a sequel, Days Gone's protagonist, Deacon St. John, is a mower of hordes and rider of bikes. A high school dropout that enlisted in the U.S. Army serving a tour in Afghanistan while hating every moment of it. His unit, whilst advancing on Mazar-e-Sharif, was ambushed and their Humvee exploded and launched off a nearby cliff, killing everyone but him. Deacon, suffering tremendously from PTSD, left the Army to drift the U.S. alone by a motorcycle. Gaining employment as a mechanic, he would eventually become an enforcer for the Mongrels Motorcycle Club. Over time, he would date a botanist named Sarah that taught him the ins and outs of plant life he would use later in life to make medicines. Shortly after their wedding, the zombie apocalypse occurs where Deacon is forced to survive the new world and settle the mysteries and more of the Freaker Apocalypse. His time in the military and roaming the greater American landscape lends much to his combat skills and resourcefulness. A nomad and fighter at heart, he can find any situation in any location advantageous. He is quick to learn how to scout for threats as well as stealthily avoiding them or attacking them from the shadows. Much like Left 4 Dead survivors, Deacon is pretty much used to mowing down dozens or even hundreds of infected at a time, meaning numbers are not a deterrent for him unless in the overwhelming category. Having a hard time responding to authority figures and only really cooperating with those that aid his kin in the end, although he does get betrayed a time or two. A veritable lone wolf acting only in part with his friend Boozer and wife, he still cooperates with others when need be. I would say his plot armor is definitely up there considering he fights droves of hordes and people without much issue, wearing not much of anything to prevent infection or gunfire from opposing factions. His snarkiness and attitude could land him in worse off situations, but his combat readiness and means of surviving just about anywhere at any time make him a formidable survivor. Plot armor is definitely a play for him, but his proficiency in motor vehicles vehicles and weapons at least allow him to back up his bite and have an excuse of getting away from fast moving infected. With all that being said, I'd put Deacon in the lower end of the A tier.
Now I won't lie, I've not seen anything Z Nation related outside a few hilarious clips like this. and hate watching its confirmed prequel series Black Summer. But people said someone from Z Nation needed to be included, so Roberta Warren was apparently a top pick. That's just what I went with. Going off the Z Nation wiki, Roberta Warren was apparently a sergeant in the National Guard stationed at Charleston Air Force Base. Before the zombie apocalypse began, she actually had a run-in with the turbulent natural occurrences of a Sharknado. Yes, a Sharknado. Surviving a tornado of man-eating sharks. 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 Only to eventually find herself a survivor amidst the puppies and kittens apocalypse. It's the sci-fi channel, what do you expect? That expertise would become familiar to her as z natos would appear in dense populations. I'll be honest with you, I've already covered a lot here and Z Nation being a rather large series, I haven't touched it yet so I had to ask one of my fans by the name of Marcellus Reigns to describe it for me and here's what they said. Roberta, despite being in a pretty lax and silly show is actually a rather capable and reliable survivor. She's very intelligent, having been able to figure out most if not all the traps the group encounters throughout the show, and easily sees through Murphy's schemes as they continue to develop over the course of the show as well. Not to mention, she's got fantastic aim, is formerly military trained, she has survived Black Summer, again, whole fucking thing, and she delivered Murphy to scientists who eventually used him to develop a cure for the zombie virus. So, with that being said, and me not having to actually look into it anymore, I'd put her probably in the B tier. Shortly after being reunited with his wife and son, a family friend by the name of Uncle has become a zombie, and in turn bitten John's wife and son. Seeing them become star-craving, flesh-craving lunatics, John quickly hogties them and leaves in search of a cure. Journeying across the American South and even to Mexico, John Marston finds himself fighting hordes of undead alongside the U.S. Army, although the Army would ditch his ass to survive on their own, leaving him to consult a mother superior on these evil entities, leading him to Escalera where the source of the zombie outbreak is discerned to be from an ancient Aztec mask that promised immortality, but instead was used by Reyes to accidentally start the undead pandemic. Returning the mask to its home, all, well, living zombies are returned to normal, and those that were slaughtered, well, it's like that one South Park episode. Do not start decapitating zombies left and right. Uh... Oh, what happened? Stan? Don't worry, babe. Everything's gonna be okay. It's working! They're turning back to normal! John, much like in the regular version of Red Dead Redemption's continuity, is your definition of an Old West gunslinger thanks to his time with Dutch's crew. He is very well versed with weaponry from his time, being an ex-outlaw, so self-defense should be no problem at all. He can also take a fair amount of damage from being hit by zombies or being set on fire, and with the goal of saving his family, he'll have no problem at all reaching his goals. He is pretty resourceful being able to scavenge bullets from zombies, and also being able to tame almost godlike beings with the horses of the zombie apocalypse. He was able to fend off zombies across the Old West, in America and Mexico, and sometimes alone, sometimes with the army, and again alone. He is willing to work with anyone that forwards his goals, and even those that fuck him over. Although he can be quick to anger and will not feel remorse for those he injures and or kills. Which, in a zombie outbreak, is a great asset, as most people will have their mentality broken by the advent of needing to kill to survive. He is an outlaw and criminal at heart, so the rules of law won't slow him down. And, yet again, another beneficial aspect to his character, considering zombie outbreaks, are largely lawless lands in a pretty quick fashion. John Marston might have one of the weakest plot armors on this list, with this being a spinoff and the fact that he dies at the end of the main game. Although, if we are talking about zombie continuity, his work at stopping the zombie apocalypse mixed with his exposure to holy water means anytime zombies are brought back by the Aztec mask, he is allowed to reanimate as a shambling corpse, but gets to retain his consciousness with it fully intact, becoming a veritable undead dead survivor. I would put John Marston in the A tier. And the last on our list, I was originally only going to have 19 survivors, but 
figured let's round it off with a good 20. And who else seems like a better fit for the end than Alice from the live action Resident Evil series of the early 2000s and onward. Created as a clone of one Alicia Marcus, daughter of Umbrella's co-founder James Marcus, Alice alongside a litany of other clones thought they were the original forms of themselves as they were tasked with protecting the mansion that housed Umbrella's secret lab experimentations in the hive. After the incidental release of the T-virus gas into the faux homestead, Alice was knocked out, not remembering anything prior. Umbrella sent a sanitization team to clean up after this mess, but security systems and infected researchers were already broken and let loose. Over time with this elite unit, Alice slowly relearned her combat skills, revealing her finesse in martial arts and more. From there, she would piece together the mysteries of her past and unlock more of what she was capable of as a veritable clone super soldier looking to exterminate the zombie kind. Her clone anatomy allowed her to gain beneficial effects from the T-virus without the zombification aspects taking over. Thanks to all this, she received superhuman strength, agility, and reflexes alongside her body, being easily able to regenerate heavy injuries in short amounts of time. She was easily able to defeat her universe's version of the Nemesis, was able to kill psychopathic humans with a single kick to the face, and is even shown to have telepathic abilities enough to cause a security guard monitoring her from another room to bleed from every orifice and die. Jesus Christ, who the hell did I pick for the last one because these powers alone are Master Chief level, if not greater. Look, I ain't seen the movies. I plan on doing a video someday discussing how the movies are as a non-fan of Resident Evil, but with everything I've discussed only being the tip of the iceberg, I'd easily slap Alice in the top of the Z tier. And hell, I know you guys are going to keep bugging me, so let's just put Master Chief and Isaac Clark there as well. Now, to cut it short, these are what we have so far. I had other survivors I wanted to cover, but going over 20 in detail seems like enough for one video. <coughs> Especially with me just getting over COVID for the second time, and all that copyright strike drama with that one little bitch. And, as a thankful appreciation for today's sponsor, Factor, if you want a follow-up or sequel video to this, where we add to this list with survivors like Chris Redfield, Daryl Dixon, Kenny, Chuck Green, Crazy Dave, Coach, or more, let me know in the comments and if this video right here reaches i don't know 10k likes and over 100,000 views in less than a month i'll consider it if you have ideas for survivors in future videos also drop their names here maybe we can add to this ultimate zombie survivor tier list did i get something wrong though was your favorite survivor snuffed here unfairly reviewed or placed on the wrong tier where would you personally put each survivor sorry if i memed a little too much in some places thank you for watching and a big thank you to the sponsor again factors as well as my patrons and youtube channel members who donate to keep the channel moving along on patreon and the good old youtube join button and you can join them on this list here for future videos and guess what my discord is back up but at the end of the day i'm just happy you watch my dumb rant videos on zombies until next time stay happy stay healthy stay surviving and most importantly stay wow